Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, for your love. We thank you, Lord, that you guide us and lead us each and every single day. We thank you, Lord, that you're with us even here at this moment. Father, open up our hearts to hear your word, each and every single one of us, that we may hear your truth. We thank you, Father, for that in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Recently, I watched a, um, it was a little bit of a documentary. I don't remember exactly where it was, probably a YouTube, but I was watching uh, this documentary, and it was really of a survey that people were going out and asking people what their faith is, where they stand in faith or spirituality, and they were trying to see where society is at in general. It wasn't anything scientific, it was just walking up and kind of talking with people. And uh, there was different perspectives, different ways that people uh, viewed uh, their spiritual life. And some people answer says, when they ask, do you attend church? Do you, what do you, what do, you do, you know? And uh, do you have faith in, in a creator? And they says, they would say, I'm a very spiritual person. And they would emphasize a very spiritual person. And you sometimes get excited when people are, are spiritual. But really, a lot of times when people say they're spiritual, it means that they believe in that there's a God, a force out there that is greater than us, but they can't explain it. And they do not ascribe to any religious perspective. These individuals consider themselves spiritual but not religious. And then you had some people that would say, you know what, all religions lead to the same outcome. Every single one leads to the same God. It's just probably God kind of showing himself in different ways. It doesn't matter if it's Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Muslims, Jews, Mormons, Jehovah's, and every other religion out there, small or large, they all lead the same way. This is a very concerning way of thinking, and I'll tell you why I get very concerned about this sort of perspective, is because it uh, means that God has given different religions different Bibles, which means he says something in one place and something totally different in another, which means he's contradicting himself, and if he contradicts himself like that, God becomes a liar and then becomes un trustworthy, and that is a very dangerous thing. And then you have other people who say, well, I'm agnostic. You know, I believe that there probably is some God out there, but we can't really prove it, so I don't even bother. I don't even try. Most agnostics, that's kind of where they're at. I have friends who are agnostic. And then you have others who are atheists, and they'll say, I'm an atheist. This is unfortunately one of the fastest growing religions, and I call it a, a religion in itself because they have a way of thinking uh, that will, doesn't want to be changed. And these individuals, they'll say, there is no God. And they'll make a huge emphasis on no God out there. There is no way there's a God. It all happened by chance from the Big Bang and on after billions of years. Then there's trees, water, and everything else here on earth. And they would ascribe to the belief that it would be better, much, much better, if religion did not exist at all in society. If we can remove every trace of God from society, society would be much, much better. And this is very very dangerous, and I'll probably touch on it a little bit later. In today's portion of Scripture, really, we're looking at John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. And we're going to go verse by verse there. But this is the sixth I am statement in this portion of Scripture. And I'll read it for us now. And it's verse, uh, chapter 14 of John, uh, verses 6. And it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And my prayer today for each and every single one of us, that we may have a deeper understanding how vital this verse is and how important it is for each of our lives. If we don't know Christ, I pray that we may fully come to this understanding so that we can live a life fully surrendered to him. Now, I don't know if you know this. Sometimes when we maybe watch movies like the, the Gospel of John or we read through the Bible, sometimes it's hard to tell 
of what span of what part of Jesus' life it is. I don't know if you ever realized this, that the Gospels generally, the four Gospels generally only cover about 50, 55 days of Jesus' life. They don't cover a whole three years, 365 times four, whatever that is. I can't, I'm not a math person, so I don't do it that quick in my head. But it it's, it's, it's only covers about 50 days. And this portion of Scripture in John chapter 14, 1 to 6, actually is, we're talking hours before Jesus is about to be arrested. Arrested and taken to the cross eventually soon after that. So here it is. Jesus knows in John chapter 13 and verse 1 actually tells us that Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. He knew. Now, this is my perspective, but I think Jesus is getting the disciples ready. I think Jesus is starting to prepare the disciples for what is about to happen. Now, I don't know if you have ever experienced some of this. I think most of us have. But now, and please don't misunderstand me. Jesus is going to pay a price so grievous. See, the pain he is going to go through, where to the point where the Father turns his back on him on the cross, is much worse than what we would ever have to do. The cross that we carry is so small compared. Even if our own lives were taken from us because of our faith in Jesus, it is small compared to Christ, what he did, and even for the disciples. But the disciples... We're about to go through something very traumatic. You have to understand the disciples gave their whole life for Christ. I mean, they just left their businesses and started following him. They left everything to follow Jesus. Their families most likely were sacrificing. People were just, they were going from town to town, praying for people. Helping people, feeding people. This is what their life had become. They sacrificed everything. They loved Jesus. But in within hours, he was going to be taken from them. That's hard when you lose somebody who you love so dearly. And even if you're ready, it becomes so difficult when you're going through it. You seem to, it, it, everything becomes more and more difficult. Fear, confusion, anger most likely would have gripped the hearts of the disciples in hours, just hours away. So Jesus seems to be getting the disciples ready, ready to, so that they are reassured, so that they may be strong. Now he begins in John chapter 14 in verse 1 with this statement. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. Troubled. Troubled about what? Troubled about what? They don't understand that Jesus is going to be taken. They, they're thinking they're just going to continue day by day what they've been doing. They're going to keep, keep doing what they're doing. Jesus is going to keep teaching. Life's not going to change. We're going to keep going. But they seem to be troubled, shaken. Their fate itself seems to be shaken. But about what? And we see it in John chapter 13. And we saw it in the video, verses 36 to 38. And it says this. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay my life down for you. And Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. This is the reason that they are troubled. You have to understand what's happening here. Peter is the guy always at the front, ready to do, ready to fight. I mean, just soon after that, he's trying to cut somebody's head off, misses and cuts off his ear. He, he is the one who's always up front. He is the one that wants to do everything. He's the one that's usually outspoken and Jesus has to correct him. This is him right here. Now, here are the disciples hearing this. And even Peter hearing this. What? What? If Peter himself is going to turn his back, is going to deny Jesus, what about us? How are we going to be strong? What is about to happen that will bring Peter to this point? And what will happen to us? This is... A reason they are troubled. 
And then he continues in verse 1. He says, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Believe in God, also believe in me. So this statement in the original language, really you can read it two different ways. You can read it in a way that says you should believe in me. Or you can read it on how could you not you cannot separate these two. You cannot separate the Father and the Son as if they're two separate things, never to communicate. They, they do different things all together. Sometimes it is, no, they are the same. They are together. Believe in me. If you believe in me, you believe in the Father. If you believe in the Father, you believe in me. But then see here, right after that, he says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? He begins to encourage them. He wants to encourage them. I'm going to take care of you. Don't worry. I'm on your side. I've got you covered. The Father has a room for you in his house. No, no, don't worry. You're not staying in a hotel, you're not staying in the shed. No, you're not staying in the garage. You have a room right in the house. Now, let me ask you a question. In your home, who gets a room? Now, I know some people have to share. And everybody's happy about sharing, right? I've never met one person that was happy about sharing. But who gets a room? Who calls their room? It's the closest people. It's the children. It's the father and mom. It's the people who live there, who call that place their home. And where, do every, where does everybody else come? They, they get the guest room. They get the guest room. If you have a guest room. Why? Because they're guests. But we are not guests in the father's house. Here, this is what Jesus is saying. I'm going to go. I'm going. I'm going to decorate this room for you. I know what you like. Don't worry. I've got enough. For you who like Legos, we're going to have Lego everywhere. I know there's a few adults here, right? You like tools? Don't worry. I'll set up your room nice. Don't worry. I'm going to prepare you because I know you. And I, we have made a room for you. We have made a room for you. But then it continues in verse 3. And it's here where the conversation takes a bit of a turn. And he says this in verse 3, he says, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And just imagine for this, wait, 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 disciples, wait a second, wait a second, Jesus. This would insinuate you, this is the second time you say it, that you're leaving. Why are you leaving and we can't come with you? I want to be with you, not later, right now. Now, right now, I don't want to depart. I've sacrificed everything. I love you, Jesus. I'm ready to, to do whatever it takes. It's just like what Peter just said a few minutes ago. And then Jesus makes a statement, which intrigues a question. And he says this in verse 4. He says, and you know the way to where I am going. This is Jesus telling the disciples, you know the way to where I am going. You should know where I'm going. You know the way. They should have known up to this point. Up to this point, he already had told them he wasn't going to be with them for a long time. He had been preparing them. John chapter 7 and verse 33 says, Jesus said to them, I will be with you a little longer and then I am going to him who sent me. He is preparing them all throughout, really, for his eventual departure. For his eventual, he's going to go to be with the Father. And he is trying to tell them, you should know. But they're so troubled. They're so distraught about what just happened with Peter and their faith. That they have forgotten all things. Wait a second. What is happening? Where are you going? What are we doing? How are we going to be able to do this by ourselves? Have you ever started to panic about something and you totally forget how to do something? You know, maybe you're, you're great, you're, you're certified in CPR, but then all of a sudden maybe a family member needs CPR help and it's like you, you freeze up for that brief moment because you're freaking out. 
because it's different when you're connected. It seems like the disciples are having this kind of moment. This is where they, they, everything is it's turned upside down. Everything that they learned from Jesus, see, they seem to have forgotten. But then Thomas asks a question, a very important question. One that they should know the answer to, but it is a good thing that he asks so that we may hear the answer today. In verse 5 says, Thomas says to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? How can we know the way? And Jesus gives an answer to this question. Verse 6 says, Jesus says to him, I am, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way. I am the truth, and I am life. Remember, he's getting them ready. We need to understand that this is an absolute statement. This isn't a maybe state. This is, this is it. I'm going to give it to you right here. Take this to heart because, he, I mean, this is it. Now, let's look at each of these parts. The way, the truth, and the life. First, the way. He says, I am the way. And the way to What? The way to the Father. The way to God. Now, briefly, going back to the third I am statement, because Pastor Wayne spoke on it. Uh, in John chapter 10 and verse 9, and they're correlated together. John chapter 10, verses 7 to 9, it says this. So Jesus, again, said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep, they did not listen to them. I I am the door. If anyone enters my life, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pastors. I am the door, he said. I am the door. See, during those times, the shepherd, he would have this sheepfold. Shepherds need to sleep. They're out. So they would create this, this uh, sheepfold where it was really almost like a room like this. And, and there's hedges all the way around. There are rocks all the way around. So the sheep are kind of stuck in there. They can't leave. And the shepherd was known for sitting in front of the door. There wouldn't be a door like you see in this image. But he would sit in front of the door so that he was the door. The sheep could neither leave nor come in. They, he would sit at the entrance while he was sleeping, and the sheep would be protected. No wolf can go in. No animal can come and ravage the sheep. Nothing can come and destroy it. He is the one that's protecting it. And the only way the sheep can enter into the rich pasture was through the door, which was the shepherd. He is the only way. There is no back door. There's no side door. There is nothing else. You cannot jump over to have your own way. No, Jesus is the only way. In Matthew chapter 7, 13 to 14 says this, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, listen church, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. There is no other way to be able to enter the rich pastors of the afterlife. There is no other way. Jesus is the only way. He is the shepherd that leads us in. Jesus is the only way that enters into the kingdom of God. To be with the Father. And it is, church, our responsibility as people to tell the world about Jesus. We cannot leave them and not say anything in their own religion. They may reject us. They may hate us. They may turn their back. But we need to share the gospel. There is no greater purpose for any Christian to continue living here on this earth outside of to share the gospel. Yes, we all have jobs, we all have things to do, but the greatest purpose that we live is to, is to go out there and tell people about Jesus. Tell our kids, tell our family members, tell our loved ones, tell the people that we don't know, to tell our enemies, to tell all about the gospel of Jesus. 
Now, on a side note, people will say, why is there only one way? Why? Why couldn't Jesus have made multiple ways to get into heaven? Make it easier. Make a few holes all the way around. Around the sheepfold. Let us all in. The question is, and the fact that we don't like to sometimes admit, we don't deserve that door. What if he didn't even create that door? And he said, you deal with it. You created an issue. You created a problem. You go ahead. You sin. Now you figure out how to get out of it. Now I know we do that with, sometimes with people. We do that. You can't always rescue somebody out of their, their own, uh, the things that they do. And because people don't learn. Sometimes we do that with our own kids, don't we? We let our kids learn and, and, and see what, what kind of happens. And then we help them. We're always there to try to help them. As well, but we let people a lot of times figure it out on their own. But he didn't. What if he didn't give us a way? What if he didn't, the Father didn't give us a shepherd to guide us out, to be our door? He is the only way. The only way. Second, he says, Jesus is the truth. He is the truth. But the truth about what, again? About God. It's about God, about the Father. Now, in the, our North American culture, which is, I'm going to say, very sad, it seems to be that truth has become relative. Relative to my situation, however I feel, it doesn't matter. Today I'm going to wake up this way, so I'm going to declare that this is my truth. And you need to accept it. As long as they say it doesn't hurt anyone, what's the big deal? You know what? Today I feel like 1 plus 1 is 15. So I'm declaring that 1 plus 1 is 15, and if it doesn't bother you, you know what? Eventually, your truth does impact society. Because when you have enough people saying that this is the truth and really it's a lie, eventually it affects in a great way society. But this doesn't work like this with God. Not a chance. Jesus is the only truth who reveals the Father to humanity. John chapter 5 and verse 19 says this, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. And then John chapter 18 and verses 37 says this, this is a conversation that Jesus and Pilate are having just before that he's going to be sent to be crucified. And it says, then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born. And for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7 actually says the true one, that it calls Jesus the true one. And I just want to read you a, a verse that I actually, it wasn't in my notes, but I, I felt like reading it because it was in my devotions uh, this morning. And it's in 2 Peter chapter 1 and uh, verses 3. 2 Peter uh, chapter 1 verses 3 says, The divine power has granted to us, sorry, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Hear that again. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through what? Through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence the knowledge the truth it is all within jesus christ our savior he is the true one jesus is the truth the authoritative one the one that reveals to us christ every time that we read this word and it may contradict with what we think in our own heads this is right and we are wrong we are wrong, and the scriptures are right. Jesus is the truth. And the third statement he says is that he is the life. He is life. 
Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 17 says this. He is the image, and listen church, he is the image of the individual God, the firstborn of all, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. All things hold together. You know, some people will, will say, you know what? We, we don't need a God, right? The atheists, they'll say, we, we don't need a God. We just need to remove God. God needs to be removed out of it. Really what they're saying is, God, take your hands off of everything. We will deal with it ourselves. But people don't understand it, that it says all things are held together in him. We do not exist outside of him. You know, in seminary, they teach you about grace. And you hear about grace. And you'll hear lots about grace here. We teach our youth upstairs a lot about uh, the grace of God. And they'll say there's a grace for salvation. But there's also a grace for, for humanity that allows us to function. That it's God who is the one that helps us to bring laws together. So that we're able to work together, live together. All the rules, all the street laws, even though you don't like those speed limits. They're there to protect us. And it is by God's grace that he allows us to live together. Nothing can be split up from God. If we would be, if God would remove his hand from us all together, we would implode in a split second. We cannot exist outside of him. All exist within him. You have to be God to exist outside of the creator. And we are not God. We have been created by him. And Jesus freely gives us eternal life. He gives it for us. The breath that you take, it's because he is the one that gives it to you. Do you remember when Adam and Eve were created? They were created out of dust. You guys remember that? Once he made the shape, and I always imagine being in a, at a beach and, you know, making a body. You know, when you bury somebody, kind of something like that. That's in my head. That's what I'm imagining. Did, the, did it get up? When did it get up? When did Adam and Eve wake up? It's when the breath of God went into humanity. It is not when he made the shape. The shape can be there. But church, life is inside of us because of God. An eternal life will be there because of God. Life is valuable. Did you know that the highest percentage of the healthcare costs are used for the last 12 months of an individual's life? The highest percentage. Now, if a person is a business person and they led this way, they'd be like, eh, that's not a good business practice. Why would I spend most of my money for this small part? I should just, nah, don't worry about this part. We, we don't need to invest all the money on this little thing right here, which is going to end up not in a good way. It ends up broken. But why do we do that? Why do we invest so much money for the last 12 months? It's because life is valuable. Life is valuable and it's what we must do. If God has given us this life, if he's given us this body, if he's given us this air, we breathe because he is the one that gives it. Now we must take care of it. We must take care of the life, whatever we can to help someone live. And honestly, the longer someone lives, the longer they have to repent for their wickedness, for their sins, and they can bow down before a holy God. Jesus has made a way out, a way out of our sins, a way out of the eternal eventually being going to hell. He has made a way out, and it is only in Christ. He is life. Every breath that we have belongs to him. But why is Jesus the way, the truth, and the life? Why is he the way, the truth, and the life? So that he can lead us to the Father. That's the goal. It's to make it to the Father. John 14, says, uh, 14, 6, the last part says, No one can come to the Father except through me. It's only through Christ 
that we can have eternal life. Jesus is the one that has made a way through the death and the cross. There is no other way. It's only Christ. And I'm going to make a statement that I think every human needs to... I kind of came to the realization a long time ago, there is no... You know how you have government programs and you can opt out? You can't opt out of this one. You can't. It doesn't matter what religion you're part of. It doesn't matter if you call yourself agnostic or an atheist. One day, when we take our last breath, we will have to hold account before the Father for every action that we have committed. See, sin must be punished. Every sin must be, including ours, including mine. The only difference with us and people who are not of the Lord is that Jesus is the one that's been punished for our wickedness. And the world will eventually be punished. And it's hard. This is the reason we have to tell the world of this way, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. You cannot opt out. And I'll tell you this for everyone who is here. There is peace in Christ. There is love in Christ. There is hope in Christ. There is purpose in Christ. If you go out there and you're trying so hard to get your fulfillment inside and you start businesses and you can't find fulfillment and maybe you even marry to, to, to find fulfillment and yet you can't find fulfillment. Never thought your spouse would leave their socks on the floor. How dare they? Or maybe, maybe you're trying to find fulfillment in sinful things. Maybe you're trying to find fulfillment in a career. And yet you still always have this void inside of you. I am telling you, the only thing that can close that void, that void can be filled, it is Christ and Christ alone. And we must go on to tell the world. Tell everyone that he is the way, that he is the truth, and he is the life. There is no other. There is no other. None but Jesus. So my encouragement, church, is we need to understand that he is everything that we're ever going to need. There is no other place where we can go. Let us pray. Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you for answering Thomas' question. I thank you, Lord, for paying the price for our sins. I thank you, Lord, for making a way, for being the good shepherd. I thank you, Lord, that you do not reject us when we We don't live up to where we should. We sin. Help us, Lord. Help us to understand that you have made a way for us to live. It's in your truth to live according to all godliness. Help us, Lord, to live according to your ways. Help us, Lord, to preach the gospel to a lost world. Father, I pray, open up the, the hearts, the ears of the one who is hearing the word for the first time out there. Father, save Brampton. Save the GTA. Save Ontario. Help people to come to faith, Lord. Let our churches be filled with new believers, Lord. Help us, Lord, to manage the people that will come. Help us, Lord, to live according to your ways. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and let's worship, church. Mm -hmm.